Uh, just as I get set up here, as a reminder about Ephesians that uh, we're partway through our chapter 5, we're getting close to the end of Ephesians, and so a little quick recap in regards to what we've learnt and where we've come from. Uh, we acknowledge, obviously, at the start how big the gospel actually is, how universal it is, uh, how it uh, you know, goes through every fibre, every being, every nuance, every atom. Uh, and, and it's something that we continue to learn. It's not just a 101 lesson and we move on with the good stuff. It is the good stuff. And we drive deeper and deeper into it. And we understood, obviously, how our faith and our, uh, and our, you know, our belief is all kept inside of Christ and kept with God, uh, by God, uh, so that no one can snatch it from us. Uh, we found out too that he knew us for the very foundation of the world, each single one of us. That he loves us unconditionally when we're in him, regardless of what we do good or what we do wrong. He just loves us. He's just, he sent his only begotten son into the world. We also understand that there is one body, unified, diverse. Uh, but unified is one body. And so with that, we understood that the first three chapters regarding Ephesians is to do with the understanding, the thinking of, the unequivocal uh, uh, you know, life that Jesus has given us and what went into that was very big, very abstract. Uh, but then Ephesians 4 to 6, the chapters, starts off by walking a life that is worthy. So how do we live that faith out? So we have the great theology, but then we have the great orthopraxy of how do we live it out? How do we walk every day in the newness of life? And we also understood on a bigger, larger scale that Ephesians is a letter to a young church, but an older church like ourselves can gain and glean a lot of information and also where we've gone straight, a bit of a plumb line if you like. We also recognise too that Ephesians is one big mission book. It's teaching us that we're on mission. And so last week, we heard about what drives us away from Christ. Uh, it also understood that the new understanding of Gentile means anyone that's outside of Christ and not in Christ. We also understand that sexual morality has crept in, not only into uh, you know, Australia in 2022, but also crept into the church, where there's not meant to be a hint of it. And we understand that we're supposed to abstain from that because it's foolishness. It also leads to God's judgment and wrath if you're outside of Christ. And so with that, we have, Paul says, have nothing to do with things like that because that was our former life. We're no longer like this. And the reason why we are to be sold out for Christ, as we took a little breather in between the chapters uh, and we looked at Matthew 8, is that because we are what has been given to us. And so for us to be able to be fully sold out, fully uh, adhered to Christ, does that mean that we can live a life that is not one of hypocrisy? And again, that's only found in the Gospel. So we come today to our passage in Ephesians, and knowing what happened last week in regards to what keeps us away um, from, from Christ, or what keeps others away from Christ, we also then look to today and say, how can we be about mission so that doesn't happen to others as well? Uh, and so I think we've got there ready to go. Great. So today it's called Sing Away the Darkness. Sing Away the Darkness. So when I first came here as a guest speaker a long time ago, probably oh, no, about six months ago, uh, to be fair, uh, and I spoke upon Zephaniah, and we went through the whole book in a very quick amount of time, and we locked on onto Zephaniah uh, 3, verse 17, which we saw God in a light that we don't often think of God in, which is a singing warrior, someone who sings over us. And so it's understandable that singing is to be part of who we are. And so I'll we'll have a quick show of hands to see who's honest today. Um, brilliant. So who here has never done karaoke before? Anyone want to admit they've done karaoke? A few hands going up. Excellent, excellent. Now, in a fit of madness, I did karaoke once. Um, and I say in a fit of uh, madness is because when I was a younger child, I hated singing in front of everybody because I'm terrible at it. Um, and then when I, I was at a school, it was a bit of a rough country school uh, over in the eastern states, just outside of Tamworth. And I was forced, because I couldn't play an instrument, I had to sing. And so I sung um, Lovers in the Air, which probably wasn't a great choice, but I picked it anyway. 
and every kid laughed, including the teacher laughed. <laughs> right? So it wasn't a great vote of confidence for yours truly. But as I said, in a fit of madness, I jumped up and I sung. And because music is powerful, it's strong, you know, it also leads you to believe that you could probably make it on Australian Idol. Um, and I think some of those people on Australian Idol, the French would have told them, no. <laughs> <laughs> but we know that music has played a very big part in our culture and cultures all around the world. Different genres, different types. But it evokes strong connections to a time and a place or a feeling. It connects what's in here with what's in here. And it, it's so powerful that we can remember our songs and song lyrics. Uh, 90s was my genre of music that I loved, even though I was an 80s kid, I loved 90s music. And I can remember almost every lyric to every 90s song. Uh, and when we do the 90s quizzes and the music quizzes, I tend to win. Uh, I don't remember the important things, like paying my bills on time sometimes, or other important things. However, I remember all the lyrics. It's not a brag, it's quite sad really. However, it is in me. And I actually uh, saw, I think, the Black Sorrows is coming to town, and Collie, that was a band that I used to listen to. I wasn't a huge fan of them, and I was wondering why I was drawn towards it, almost wanting to go. I uh, only you know one of their songs, which is quite a popular song, I won't sing it, because as I told you, a beautiful voice, a rough passage, so I'm not going to do that to you this morning. Uh, but it came back to me, and I was wondering what it was. And as most of you know, I didn't have a real brilliant childhood. Uh, but one of my fondest memories was that particular song, my mum, my dad and myself both liked. It was at Unifying Understanding. We used to sing it together when it come on the radio. So that was a, a powerful emotion that was pulled uh, back into memory by that singing even just the words again on that song. Music is very, very powerful. Now you will like, you will have your favourite parts and songs that you like. You'll have uh, particular maybe your team is winning really well. Mine isn't really doing that great with rugby, but <laughs> that's all right. Island singing is doing a lot better. Um, but uh, with that is that you have your favourite team song that you might sing for your favourite favorite, favorite, uh, team. Uh, it might be the Wildcats for basketball. That, that's for me. It might be uh, in, the, you know, in the footy. Uh, it could be Eagles. It could be Dockers. Uh, it could be a whole range of different things. I remember taking uh, Ethan, who is uh, a big soccer fanatic, or football for those who want to be purists, uh, and he loves soccer. So we took him down uh, to Perth Glory, and it was incredible to see the amount of song that went around in the charts. We learned a few choice words that we probably weren't too pleased with, um, but that sometimes what happens in our Aussie culture. But the singing was loud, uh, and it was powerful, powerful song. Uh, maybe it's a national anthem. Maybe you're very patriotic and you love singing the national anthem, and so you're singing that at the top of your lungs. Or, like me, there's a song that invokes a powerful memory that every time it comes on, you must sing it. You know, and if you are like me and you don't sing in public, but you sing in your car and you pull up a set of lights and someone looks at you like you're crazy because they can't hear you because the windows are up. Um, but we do that. In our culture, music is part of who we are. But what about the church? Where do you see yourself singing in church? Because we're going to find out in a little while that this idea of singing, uh, praise and hymns and songs is part of the worship, which is singing, but it's in, in the imperative. It's a command to sing. So what about that? How do, can we not sing in church with great gusto, knowing the truth that we have that lies inside of us? However, we tend to dim it down a little bit whether it's our stoicism, uh, whether it's different traditions where we come from, whether it's whether we're told to pipe down as a kid in church, I don't know what it is. Possibly it could be doing with some of the modern worship songs that are not, we're not used to. I don't know what it is. But it is something that is lacking in church by and large. We sing beautifully here, but imagine if we could let go and sing in the face of the evilness and the darkness that goes before us. How much more should it be powerful and linked to us to sing words of praise, words of scripture as we sing songs? Uh, the worship leaders have a, a, a big task when they're picking songs, not just to pick favourites, but to pick songs that really tie in with God's word, that really connect in a powerful way that makes us all remember that. And I'm okay, I'm, I'm, safe, to, I'm safe and sound in my abilities. I know that more often than not, you'll remember a worship song than my sermon. Because music is power. But all of it goes ties in. So our worship leaders, they tie in to the themes that we're talking about. And as we've heard, and 
it was this morning again, and Christine gave a great testimony a few weeks ago, that God himself, through the Spirit, connects us in the way of the order of our service and what we sing and what we say, and he orchestrates it all so beautifully and powerfully. So today, it brings us to our two points that we want to look at. Living with purpose and living in the Spirit. Living with purpose and living in the Spirit, if you're taking notes this morning. So, our very first little chunk of scripture there uh, is chapters uh, 5, verses 15 through to 17. It says, be very careful then how you live. This is backing on to what we heard last week about staying away from all sexual immorality, staying away from the darkness, and to understand that we're supposed to be called in uh, into uh, four, uh, I think 14, uh, oh, sorry, 514, that we're called into Christ's light. So wake up, old sleeper, and let God's light shine upon you. And that's from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. And so with that comes this idea of the Messiah. The Messiah is the light. You see, the Old Testament saints, when they sung, they were singing towards the, the soon coming Messiah. Us, post the cross, we sing about the Messiah has arrived. So Christ is at the very centre of everything that we do in the worship service. Our singing is centred around the Son. Of course it's centred around the Trinity, <coughs> God, the Son, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but of course God the, the Son came into our world, put on, tabernacled amongst us, maybe put on flesh and walked amongst us and lived the life that we could not live. And you all know by now my favourite verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we would know the righteousness of God. In other words, he took his sin upon us, on himself, that we should have bore, and he went to the cross, died in our place, and in return, we get to put on his righteousness as if we had never sinned. And so because of that great exchange upon the cross, which we remember every week of our communion service, we can meet here powerfully, and we can sing thanks giving and praise to our King and our Saviour, our Lord and our Saviour. And so with this, we understand that therefore, we're not to be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, the Lord's will is a big thing, isn't it? I, mean, I remember being a young Christian going, who am I going to marry? What job do I need to pick? What car do I drive? Where do I live? You know, it was all about what was God's will for my life in X, Y, and Z. But we're going to touch on a little bit later what that actually looks like. And part of it is a bit of a, uh, a you know, that happened last week in our, in our uh, sermon, was that we talked about what God is to us, that we do what is, pleases Him, because we are in a relationship with Him. And Paul literally tells us to go and test it, to go and prove it, to go and, you know, search the Scriptures to understand God's love for us, and what pleases him. And so a carry-on of this is to be in his will. And what does that look like? We'll touch on that in a little while. Uh, but we are to take every opportunity to live in Christ's light. That's the idea of it. And so we are not to be foolish. We're not to live like the foolish people live. And you can scour your scriptures and you will find lots and lots and lots of verses on being a fool. And I can name them all for you this morning, but they all stem really from Psalm 14.1, which is the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. So foolishness is not just saying that you don't believe in God. You know, because a lot of people say they believe in God, but by their actions, the way that they live their life, will show you true to who they really believe in. And they don't believe in God, so therefore their life will not reflect that. I mean, it might reflect it in small ways, because we know we're made in the Imago Day, as we heard away a few weeks ago, made in God's image, and it's been fractured by sin, so we see these little glimmers of it. But by and large, you'll know them by your fruit. How do they live their life out? My question to you is, how do you live your life? You might say, I believe in God, but does your actions back that up? Because it's foolishness if it doesn't. And maybe you've let foolishness enter into your life and redirect away from God's light. The enemy is a roaring light seeking who he can devour. But we think that he might just come and take us off in one bite. No, he slowly, slowly will nudge us away from God's light until we're living a life that is not effective for him. 
And so we are a church that is on mission. We are a church here that reads these scriptures, wants to live them out here in Collingwood. And so what does our life look like? And again, many people will say, I have my family who say they believe in God. They do not. They do not. And you can tell by their fruit, by their actions, by their deeds. So here we have a look at this. What is the opposite of foolishness? Well, it's to be wise. So what does Paul say to us in this scripture? How do we be wise? We take every opportunity that we can. We are to redeem the time. How do you redeem the time, you might ask? Good question. Glad you asked. You redeem the time by refocusing and focusing our life on the one who has sent us. And we understand if we are redeeming the time, well, how do we live our actual life? So in a year's time, or a years and years' time, what are we focusing on? What are we focusing on in the months? What are we focusing on in the weeks? What are we focusing on today? What are we focusing on hourly, even? Is our focus in our heart really tuned into what he wants us to do? Now, what does he want us to do? Well, he wants us to show action towards outsiders. Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Go, therefore, and make disciples of every nation, baptising in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. That's our role. That's also a command. How does your life looking like that as the church? How does that look? How Because that is wise. Now, each one of you, I could ask you, but I won't. You can probably put your hand in your pocket or hand next to you or in your bag and pull out a little thing called a smartphone. This device is supposed to make us uh, have more time. It does the opposite, doesn't it? And we think to ourselves, I just don't have the time, Shane. I don't have the time. Paul had that reasoning too from his first audience. Otherwise, he wouldn't bring it up. We, they had the same 24 hours as us. They had distractions that are different to us, but distractions nonetheless. We still have the same 24 hours. And it was funny, because Mel was saying to me yesterday, saying, you know, even if we had 30 hours, we'll find a way to fill that with distractions as well. So true. And so when we look at our little smartphone and our, even our smart devices, there's a little thing on there which talks about screen time. If you want to shock yourself, have a look at how much average your screen time is per day, and you might freak out. In some cases, it's a few hours, even. And so if you think about it, that's over the course of a whole day, but if you start adding up over a week, that's 14 hours, and some of you are smarter than maths than me, if you continue to multiply that out, that can lead to months, maybe even years of the time that God has given to you, that precious time to give to you to what? To go out to redeem people through your testimony, through your message of the gospel. Why? Because we know the plight of the wicked. They receive God's judgment and God's wrath. We heard about that last week. We've escaped that because of Christ. We will do a disservice if we have the answer and we're not doing anything about it. Well, that's not our priority. And again, that doesn't mean you have to leave your job and go into the Congo. It might. I know someone that actually did do that and then got sent off to the Congo, but that's a different story. But it might be right where you're placed right now, your workplace, your high school, uh, your sporting club, uh, your social club, whatever it might be, God has placed you there to be on mission. How are you going? Now, I mentioned the smart device. There's so many other distractions too, isn't there? I mean, we were talking this morning uh, with, with David, we were saying that basically the, one of the biggest religions here in Australia is sport. We worship sport. We go down and we spend hours on uh, hours on watching it, taking our kids to it, watching it on TV, and a little bit of it's okay, isn't it? But when it becomes our whole life and our whole being, I had a friend of mine who got absolutely taken away from church. He was in his prime, he was doing a lot of great stuff, and got taken away by little athletics. It ruled his life, where he was ineffective, and he never regained after that, that finished. He never came back to where he was. And so we need to be aware of these things. We need to pre-prioritise what we are doing. We need to be very careful how we live. Not as unwise, but as wise. So that might mean you need to readjust our aim and our trajectory. We might need to recalibrate our lives, drop off some time-wasting gadgets and life pursuits. Because other things is our own empire building. Our retirement fund, our retirement plan, our oh, I'll serve God when the kids are all gone and when I've retired. That seldom happens. We are here in the now. We don't know when Christ will come back, do we not? 
We have a look at our world events, we have a look at what's happening right now, and we go, Lord, come quick. But when we say come quick, what are we doing? Are we sitting on the rooftops where Paul and Thessalonians, the first Thessalonians or second Thessalonians, tells people to stop wasting time and just waiting? We're supposed to be about the Father's business. And our job is to go and proclaim. We are all proclaimers. Not the song, I mean, we're singing the singers, right? We're not, we're, you know, not on all 500 miles and not 500 more, for the gospel's sake. Okay, we sing that song, remember that. And so here's how it should look. What should be happening inside of churches with a reprioritised life is a problem. You should be causing problems in church. And no, not those kind of problems that a church normally has. I'm not saying that. Good problems. So good problems like, for example, like every role, like audio visual, maintenance, hospitality, church cleaning, uh, you know, uh, church choir, uh, whatever it is, um, outreaching, all of that. Because it's a, such a big gospel, all of that is for gospel service. Audio visual, if you can't hear the word spoken and, and we can't hear the word sung, you can't hear the gospel. When you're having a nice clean place where people get invited in and they feel comfortable and warm, they're not distracted, they're focused on what God wants them to focus on. Do you see how big the gospel is? When you come to men's breakfast and invite that friend to come along, when you go to just do some discipleship. Now, discipleship doesn't just start in the church. We tend to think that it does. It doesn't. Discipleship starts out there in the marketplace. Your neighbour, your family member, your school friend. Any conversation you have about Jesus is starting a discipleship program. See it through. Be part of that. Friendship evangelism in Australia is brilliant because people get to see who you truly are. They understand who you are and they will follow along. Now, of course, there's all different ways of evangelising. We've covered that a few weeks ago. Uh, but that might be your way of doing things. You see, the other thing is that the bank account should be full. We should have a problem of like, how do we use all these people for all these uh, positions now? We go, okay, what do we need to do? Because there'll be so many coming to us, like youth group, for example. You know, should have 40 or 50 people coming going, oh, do it. Oh, right. Oh, uh, well, what do we? we don't have that, do we? Our bank account should be overflowing. Why? Not for our coffers sake, but so that the gospel can go out far and wide. You know, it would be a good problem to have to figure out how do we farm this money out for the gospel's sake. Wouldn't it? Martin Luther, the original Martin Luther, uh, he said the last thing on somebody that gets uh, converted is their wallet. Why? Because their focus is on themselves, empire building. When you understand that it's about God and his kingdom, then things becoming a little bit clear. And so Paul will continue on, and we can go into our second part here, uh, which is living in the spirit. Now, part of that is that how do we redeem the time? Well, it makes sense. Don't get drunk, right? Uh, that drunk is, being drunk is a waste of time, a waste of money, a waste of resources, and it can lead to sexual immorality. It can lead to other things and other sins as well. What I want you to notice, what it doesn't say, is drinking. Okay, now I'm not advocating for drinking or advocating against drinking. I'm just saying what the scripture tells us. And we know that the scripture says to us that alcohol in itself is not the problem. So we know that Jesus turned water into wine. And people go, well, that was grape juice. Well, people don't get tipsy on grape juice. There's no kid that gets drunk on wine. There's no adult that gets drunk on grape juice. So it's talking about wine. And there was also beer there as well and around the areas. Now, what we're trying to say here is that it was used for medicinal purposes. It was also used to celebrate. And so Paul is not saying don't drink. He's saying don't get drunk. We, you know, we, so how can we redeem the time the best? And for us, in our society, it might look like not drinking at all because of the systemic problem that we have in Australia with the alcohol issue. I mean, let's have a look at it. For example, a little bit of alcohol is a depressant. It slows down uh, the uh, information between your brain and your body, and it affects the way that you think, feel, and behave. And we know that our, our, our brain are very, very important for our belief system. Um, you know, God says that it's objective. You know, we've got the object, we've got the subjective, we've got the brain, we've got the feeling, and both will travel together, governed by what we know and what we think, and how we think, and our conscience and that. So, stimulants like alcohol can wear that down. It can break through that uh, and cause grief. 
It can lead, uh, obviously lead to poor impulse control and decision making. And we know, as we heard uh, that you know, just a minute ago, that uh, you know, it can lead to other immoral acts as well, including sexual immoral and with other virtuous ways. At least half of all acquaintance sexual assault, so that is people that know each other in a sexual assault, uh, 50% uh, is alcohol related. So either by the perpetrator or by the victim, and in most cases, both. The other thing is, is that it also affects the fight and flight reflexes. So that's why when someone gets themselves into a, a predicament, a, a victim might get themselves in the area, they won't notice that they're in danger until it's too late. So these are the things that alcohol can affect. I mean, it can affect also our cognitive function and our distance, judging distance. So our accident rates here in Australia are sky high. Deaths by alcohol, 5,500 per annum. That's way too many. 157,000 people admitted to our health system because of alcohol-related issues. And a total of a whopping $14 billion per annum is spent with alcohol-related issues. That's a lot of money coming from taxpayers, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Christians can live uh, and get ruined by alcohol as well by misuse. It's so taboo in church circles that anyone struggles with it doesn't bring it forward and they just keep doing it in secret. It's not just congregants. People amongst the clergy has increased in drinking. And I, I know a few people that in ministry that have got drunk and has continued to get drunk because they started off just a little bit to help with the stress. And it's continued into them causing them fights and arguments and in some cases even divorce. And so we need to be mindful of this, don't we? Proverbs 23, 29. Says this. And it's a great indication of why we ought not to be drunk. <coughs> Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will be stra see strange sights and your mind will imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They hit me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so that I can find another drink? Does that sound like Australian culture uh, by and large? It certainly does. Now, the Bible says for not to be a wine bibber, which isn't a whiner, you know, a guy with a bottle and a, and a paper bag walking around staggering. We are not to be like that. We have to be redeeming the time. So, we must remember when it comes to alcohol, we need to be very, very mindful. When's that one too many? You know, you're not able to trust yourself just to have one with the, with the boys or one with the ladies. And so, even though it might be a uh, freedom that you might have, you might look at something like 1 Corinthians 10, 23, which Paul says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. How are you going to redeem in regards to your rights, in regards to your culture. How are you going to retain the, the time? What's it going to look like to you? Well, there's one thing we do, we live in the spirit. That's the whole idea. We live in the spirit life that we've been given. And so with that, we understand that we are in a battle. We're in a spiritual battle. Now, in the Old Testament times, what they used to do was send the worship team out before a physical battle. battle. And that wasn't just the bad singers just to get rid of them, or the drummers, right? Um, I, I can make that joke in my son's drum. Uh, and so, but what they did was a sense, a sense of sending it out to be encouraged, to give victory, to give praise to God, who, and also understanding that the battle had already been won. They were singing their victory song before they went out. Likewise, we are in a spiritual battle. We heard that a few weeks ago. You know, the, the light and the dark, the evil and the good. There is a boogeyman behind all of the evilness, and that's Satan. And so with that, we are in a spiritual warfare. If you could see it in the natural, you'd be amazed to see what was going on and the battle raging around you and how much the Spirit keeps you safe. So with that, though, we sing. We sing praises. We sing the darkness away. We sing against evil. Memory Bible verses, it's great to sing. We, when I was at Bible college, uh, theological college, we 
uh, left the Psalms and like every Australian, we just started to read it out. And our lecturer said, no, 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 you are to sing it. And he would get us to sing it in the rhythm that it was designed for. And then when we sung them, I mean, Psalm reading them is just powerful in and of themselves, but when we sung them, oh, it just connected. Because you'll hear me a lot talk about us making sure we use our brain. When we're in the, in the objective, let that control our subject, which is our emotions. Right? But we are also emotional beings. We've been designed that way to feel, to experience, to understand God with our touch, taste, feel, and look. And so we see creation and we smell creation and we get excited about creation and we get very passionate about Jesus because we've been made spiritual beings. Now, you might have come from a tradition or a church background that has been overly anti-emotion, and that was certainly my case because of the damage it can do, because, you know, who can know the heart is deceitfully wicked. But there is a balance for that, isn't it? And so with singing, and singing good songs, singing psalms and, and wonderful things like that, because if you don't, and you just let your emotions run, then you sing songs about your bearded girlfriend Jesus or your bearded boyfriend Jesus which is an operation. It's not what that's meant to be. It's meant to lift up the King, the Lord and the Saviour. But if you're singing the right songs, it connects the objective with the subjective and it becomes solidified in who you are. You get to experience it and understand it, which is just a powerful blessing from the Lord above. And so with that, we need to make sure that we're singing in the darkness way. It is a command, by the way. So guys, in particular, how are we going to raise our voices higher than what we normally do? Because I don't want to be sexist or anything like that. Females are singing beautifully. But when men sing together, when we go to men's conferences and you hear the roof and lift off with a thousand guys, it's just something special about it. Um, you know, and ladies in my life, my wife, and my mother in law, and a few others are very strong women and very strong for the Lord, but say that they love it too. There's something special in the guys who lift that roof off. So in our culture, we need to go away from the stoicism, our hang ups, our embarrassments, and we need to let the rip. And it's not karaoke, is it? Not karaoke. And so we had a friend of mine who, uh, well, he's a friend now, but when he came to us at Byford, he was suicidal, not a Christian. Um, and through building a relationship and counselling with a few of us, he decided to come to church. Now, he said, if I come to church, the roof will fall in. I said, well, I've been in there and haven't fallen down yet. It should have done if I came in there. And so he decided to come along one day, and he walked in, and the first thing we said is, like, look, the roof's all off. It's great. And he laughed, and he looks behind me, and he goes, oh, you guys do karaoke here. And I went, hey. I turned around, and I saw the words up, and our worship singers like this morning, uh, up in Byford, were doing the same, we were practicing beforehand. I went, I guess kind of, yeah, maybe. Might have been Christian karaoke. But I said, but it's so much more than that. He goes, oh, okay. I couldn't quite explain it. By the end of it, he was in tears. He was singing these songs with Black Gusto. He was a stoic Kiwi, because we're just as stoic as the Aussies. And he just, he, he said, I don't know what came over me. just welled up and I sang and I was in tears. And again, I wasn't, uh, you know, disappointed that he couldn't remember my sermon, but he remembered the songs that we'd sung. It was about Jesus. And not long after that, he got redeemed. God rescued him from his sin. So, singing is powerful. It declares his praise and his glory. And as I said to you before, uh, you know, we understand that this... Verse here, open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Why? Well, because Zephaniah 3.17, God shows himself as a singing warrior. He sings over us. Do you know how beautiful and precious that is? How amazing that is? He sings over us because we are his kids. And in return, we respond by singing back. Now, singing will take all different forms. Hands raised, hands not raised. You're swaying to and fro, not swaying to and fro. Uh, you know, reflective singing and then loud singing. It'll be all there, but you have to sing. There's a command to sing to or what stop, whatever's stopping you from lifting off the roof. That's how we are supposed to be. Now, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, uh, now, we don't know 100%. We don't have a lot of information about uh, how, what songs they sung or how they sung them or what scores of music they used uh, and whether it overlaps or whether these are individual. We do know that they sung psalms. We do know they sung about the Messiah. And so whatever it means, it doesn't matter exactly that. It's meant is that we need to sing. One of the commands here is to sing and to sing 
hard and high and all that. So you need to think about those times when you sing loudly at a sporting event or the national anthem or your 60s or 70s or 80s music or whatever it might be and think to yourself, why don't I sing like that in church to my God who has done wonderfully more than my sporting team will ever do for me or my, or my nation will ever do for me or whatever you put an X, Y and Z in there. And so with that, we need to understand that this battle has already been won and that we sing praises, we sing glory, and we sing so that we can go out into the battlefield because we are his soldiers. We are his foot soldiers to go out and spread the good news. Yeah. And so we need to sing. We need to read our word. We need to do all those things, but we need to sing it. We need to understand it so that we can sing it. And so with that, we need to be assured of these things. What is God's will? I told you I'd finish off with that. So you might say, what is God's will for my life? How will I know what God's will is? Well, if you've been paying attention, you would have already seen it in the scriptures, but let's look at them again from other portions of scripture. So God's will, number one, 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, This is good and pleases God, our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. What is God's will for your life? To speak Jesus to everybody. To live your life out where the gospel flow from you, whether it's your hairdresser, your work colleague, your neighbour, your family member, whoever it is, may your light shine before them. May they see a different life that is lived. Obviously, you need these words, but also by your life. Let your actions show that you follow God. And people will soon follow. Testimonies are fantastic because testimonies are yours. People can't deny what's happened to you. And if you live that out, it's even more powerful. So that's God's will for your life. 1 Thessalonians 4 3 is our next verse. And it says, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Keep within God. Keep within the Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean go and sit in the corner and don't and avoid the world. That's not what we're talking about. Jesus was amongst the world and he was sanctified. So we have the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. We stay clear, we stay away from foolishness, and if foolishness enters into our life, we repent, we fall to our knees. We ask God to forgive us and we lose all good with him. Because this is the beautiful thing about grace and about mercy and about the gospel is that he has given us this amazing ability to be forgiven ongoing. He exists in the past, present and future. And so with that, we are sanctified. We are clean. We have God's righteousness. We have those things we read about in the first three chapters of Ephesians that God keeps our Salvation keeps our faith and keeps us in his hand where nobody can snatch it. And so what else is the will God's will for our life? Give thanks in all circumstances. You go into a mountain top high, sing praises. You go in the valley low, sing praises. Read the Psalms if you need inspiration. Loss of wife, loss of family members, loss of you didn't name it. The Psalms are real, they're raw, and that's one thing. I think we're lacking sometimes in our church to sing the lament songs. Because not everybody can come high all the time, but we can still give thanks to God through the darkness. So that's the rule for our lives. Verse Peter 2, 15, For it's God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live like a wise person. Oops. Back forward, we go. Um, and so we need to be doing good. We need to be Silence ignorant for talk of foolishness. We need to be living it out. We need to be doing, uh, living the gospel, not just speaking it. And if you forget all of that, like I know you probably will, because let's face it, it's easy to. If you really want the big picture of knowing what God's will is, Matthew 6 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So, as you can see, God's will for your life is that you build his kingdom, not your own so if you follow that and you pursue that and you understand that and give you that full attention, everything else will fall into place. The person you marry, the job you get, the direction of your life, what you should be doing for a living, how you should drive, all those things. If you focus on this, the rest of it to you will be added to you and you'll know what God's will for your life is because you're seeking his kingdom first. So in wrapping up, sing, we sing to remind ourselves, we sing to remind each other of biblical truth. It connects the objective with the subjective, which unifies us together to be living out the same gospel. Singing is part of the message. And often through the power of singing, we'll remember the song and what's sung more than the sermon itself. But it's all connected and all join in. 
um, confirm what we are learning in Scripture by singing. Uh, we sing worship songs that can chase the enemy from our mind. If you're being plagued by the enemy and you're struggling and to even think about uh, Scriptures, you sing a worship song. You sing a good one, and he will soon flee from you. Uh, it will sing to chase the darkness away. Sing a new song. Yes, we might get caught up in traditional worship songs that we love dearly, and yes, they are a very important part of our life, but don't get stuck there. We're called to sing a new song. We're not, it's not karaoke. We don't get to the news. We get to sing songs of fresh. We get to sing songs of old, and we get to sing together because God is worth singing all those songs together and more and more and more. And more importantly, as a group, we get to know him more intimately. We get to know him as the singing warrior who sings over us and we get to sing back in unison to him. Sing a new song. Chase the darkness away. 